Welcome to Ask GMBN. It's a really special one, right? Because we've got a big brain box in the shed this week in the form of Andrew Dodd. Oh, I thought you were talking about the guy behind the camera. No, he's brainy uh, too. He is brainy yeah. too. Dude, how are you? All right. Very well, this thank you. This is great. Yeah. I love doing an ask, but I love it even more when I've got someone who actually knows what they're talking about, unlike Blake Sampson, who's a, who's a numpty. There's no, well, at least you can read. I can read. At least yeah. you can, I read. can read. Sorry, Blake. I, I can write as well. You know. yeah. Blake does love Blake does love reading actually. He does. He does. Yeah, he, does. he likes Roger Red. These days. He likes Roger Red Hat. He mm. likes Room on the Broom. <laughs> he likes all of those big books. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right. Let's get on with this Ask GMBM. We've got some great questions as always that you guys have been leaving in the comments section below the videos and using the hashtag Ask GMBM. So uh, let's get into it. I'm going to test you out here, Doddy. Mm. Um, okay, James Doyle is our first question, and he says, "Hi guys, I've just started to learn dirt jump tricks and want to try a backflip." Oh God, I don't. You're, know if ask, you're asking me. I for don't, well, I don't know if you should ask Arthur this, this <laughs> yeah. question. I don't like where it's going. Um, don't know what type of jump to do it on. Okay, or where to do it. Can you guys give me some tips and advice? Thanks and love the show. Um, I tell you, what, have you ever tried a backflip? Do you know I, what? I haven't. You can, you can, you've always had a really nice table, speed table, Good table, red yeah. table. I've always liked that about your riding. Oh. You come into the thing and do oh, a nice. Thanks. No, it's not like one of those Steve Gill 1996 ones. Completely yeah. flat. It's, yeah. it's a speed table. A speed I like table. It. I like speed it, table. yeah. It's a new type yeah. of table. You know, like... Uh, I'll go can, with that. You know, you know, it's like a... It's, not, it's not a... Duh, it's yeah. a... Bleh, oh, cool. You know, I'll, you know I'll sort of thing. Yeah. yeah, so have you ever tried a backflip? Um, I haven't, but if I was going to try one, it would yeah. certainly be a foam pit or water. Probably foam pit. Yeah, that's Because I like to think it's least likelihood of hurting myself. Yeah, trouble is with foam pits, uh, not all foam pits are the same. So there are Very bad true. ones. Yeah. So I'd definitely go to a respected uh, skate park that's got a foam pit. Even better, it's got a resi ramp as oh, well. Oh, so you could build up to uh, well, hard you, landing. You, you get it going in the foam pit. Yeah. You start spinning it in the foam pit. You do a lot of them. Like, a lot of them. Do, like, a hundred, right? So you're like, oh, yeah, okay, I just almost can't not do it. And then you take it to the resi ramp, super bouncy, super slidey. You'll you'll probably slide out on some landings, but then you start getting the feeling of where you catch the ground, mm. and then you take it to a jump after that. But trying to stay consistent with a takeoff is really important because every time you change the transition, the flip changes wildly. You, you know you wouldn't believe the difference a, a different transition would make. So uh, try and be consistent with the transition, but it wants to be I go five foot at least on the transition okay. because then you're quite a long way around the flip. Already. Helping you already. You're, you're basically nearly pointing upwards as you come out the ramp. Then you just sit into it and away she spins. Do you know what? Cool but we story. should go and do that video where you do some backflips. Well, that would be fish. hilarious. Oh, God. Terrifying. Oh, um, and it is you know terrifying. Neil learned to flip in a day and he beat the famous free rider, Thomas Vanderam. Wow. Who, who was trying to learn to flip. Yeah, yeah. Many years ago, um, I did a trip with Neil to Santa Cruz and Aptos and all that stuff. That's crazy. And um, someone said to him, why don't you learn to flip? We'll go to Cam, Cam McCall's house because he's got a, a backyard pool yeah, with a ramp. Yeah, yeah, And he used to ride off the roof, drop in, and Neil, in about three attempts, nearly mm. had it round. Wow, that's and crazy. And four or five goes, he pretty much landed, and they're like, cool, let's get the step up. <laughs> so he went straight to a sandy yeah. sort of dirt step up, Yeah. and his first run in, he did a flip. Yeah, that's and he, amazing. He did, it was the worst land you've ever seen. But you rode it out. Hey, if you get out, you've it, gone round, it, it, it counts. Done. Yeah. Bang, you've done it. Yeah, you've it's really it. cool. Take it home, that's yeah. the way. Yeah, oh, I love it. I love a flip. I do love it. We're going to do that video. So, yeah, oh, <laughs> the other one you mentioned actually, water. Really good yeah. idea. Jumping into water, but you've got to make sure it's super, super deep. Yeah, and yeah. probably have some friends in the water yeah. or ready to jump in and get you. Yeah, yeah. I actually, my first flip um, that I tried into a foam pit, I broke my back um, and uh, had to have six months off while the bone, it was just a skeletal injury. Wasn't How did you bad. break your back in a foam pit? Oh, it was a crap foam bit. So uh, I, I broke my back and then I thought, damn, I've got to learn this trick. Then I went to a lake. I hired a lake. It's quite near to our offices, actually. Um, oh, I know Vobster. the one. Vobster Quarry. Yeah, yeah, I hired the whole lake for the day and a diver. <laughs> <laughs> and I took a ramp there and I practiced flips into this giant lake. And when I say a deep giant lake, it's huge, isn't it? Oh, I've got a plane to um, all sorts in there. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, I hired this lake so I could get it right. And then I went back to that foam pit and I nailed that sucker. 
Nice. Got it. Yeah. Got it. I don't think I've ever said sucker before. No. I don't know if I can you get away with you. it. I think, no, I think you should say it. Yeah. <laughs> that was a long answer. Sorry, James. I hope that worked. Phone pit, basically. In, yeah. in short, <laughs> go to a phone pit. <laughs> right. Caleb uh, Maitlin says, uh, why doesn't Blake ride slope style anymore? Oh, that's interesting, isn't it? Because... I I think you'll, I think you'll uh, really have some sympathy for this. Is that our job's great, mm. but it enough changed the direction of riding. Oh, hundred percent. Because yeah. you start just finding out new stuff. Yeah, you find yeah. new stuff and you focus on different things. Uh, and yeah. let's face it, to do slope style and, and even be vaguely competitive, you've got to be doing that non-stop. Yeah, every you've got day. to be completely focused on that. Mm. Look, all the slope style greats. So basically, they live and breathe it. Yeah. And yeah. I think the pressure of doing it. I yeah. mean, I've no doubt Blake could ride most slope style courses. Oh, he could he's, definitely ride the course. And he'll, he'll pull yeah. some cool tricks here and there, but he's not going to be laying down tricks like, you know, the Seminoks and all the no, amazing riders no. of today. And he wouldn't be laying down the tricks he would have done three years ago. Yeah, you know? sure. Because you've got to be doing those tricks every day. Yeah. And I tell you what, Blake does not miss the pressure of comps. He didn't like... Mm. He did. I don't think that was what r the riding was for Blake, doing the comps. Yeah. It was about, like, having the fun with everybody and enjoying and stuff, it. Yeah. And, yeah, he's always made really great videos. Um, but I tell you what I've noticed about Blake and with... There's a video coming up soon about who is the fastest GMBN <laughs> presenter. Yeah. And what I have noticed about Blake is he's not doing tricks a lot, yeah. but he's riding a lot of trails and he's getting quick. He's getting quick. He's getting yeah. good. Yeah, he's getting yeah. a lot faster than he used to be. He used to be all like noise and shapes. Now he's like darting down the trails fast. Well, he's, he's trying to get better. his cornering worked out, isn't he? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. No, he used to treat every well. turn like a 90 degree. But look out for that one. Who is the fastest <laughs> GMBN presenter? You might be who surprised. Indeed? Was it you, Doddy? <laughs> Might yeah, be I you. I think you will be surprised if it was me, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. Right, now, talking about Blake, let's take a look at his enduro on a hardtail video. Right, dropping in stage one. Right, stage three. Ooh. It's so open up here. Windy. I'm riding up a river. It's a nice techy climb though, especially one-handed holding the GoPro. Right, next question is from Milan van der Linde, and he says, I want to buy some lock-on grips that have inside diameter of 2.22 centimeters. Um, and the size is 13.8 to 2.9 centimeters but the bike is a giant hang on doddy i'm, I'm lost here right and basically right. i think milan's asking I know what's going on there. what can he put his grip on is it going to fit his bike all bicycles have the same outside bar diameter where your handlebar grips go and that's 22.2 um so they're all the same they're universal right what you might be getting confused with is the size of the bars where they're clamped by the stem so traditionally oh, they were 25.4 yeah in fact traditionally they're 22.2 but not on mountain bikes Early mountain bikes were 25.4, then they went up to 31.8, which is still quite common, and you also get the oversized 35 now. Right, okay, but but importantly for Milan, where the, the, grips, are, the, where the grips are, always 22.2. 22.2, They are right. all the same, they will all fit. The only thing you need to check is sometimes some grips are a lot longer than others. Oh, uh, okay, so you need to maybe look where the sweep's going down in case yeah. it's a narrow bar. Okay, yeah. right, okay. Oh, that's good to know, Milan. Fine. All good. Most All grips good. are between 100 and 125 millimetres long. Yeah. So. Boy, you know your numbers. You really do know I know my millimetres, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right, Kai Hartman says, I own a POC Tech Tool helmet. I've got nice one. Nice choice. Very nice. Um, and the corresponding POC Crave glasses. Mm. Uh, Neil is smashing trails with the glasses stuck upside down in the front top of the helmet. Mm. Um, in my case, they won't stay in place. How do you do it? Do you do that? No, they don't stay in place. I don't know how he does it. I put mine in the back, actually. Ah, right. In the upper vent at the back. I put them in upside down and slide them in. Right. And so how does Neil do it at the front? I mean, let's have a look. Oh, that was nearly a disaster. Yeah, so they go neatly in the back, right there. Bang. Oh, okay. And Neil's putting them somewhere in here. In fact, do you want me to go get my helmet? and show you. Should I go get my helmet? Yeah, show us how you do it. I'll go get my helmet. Okay. Ah, right. right, here we go. Okay, so said helmet. Yes. Goes on head, hit the trails in your glasses. Looking rad. And sometimes yeah. they, they are quite rad glasses to be fair. Mm. Um, I will pull them off the top and actually pop them in there. Oh, neat. 
That's the way to do it. Keep Quite high. nice for climbing, and sometimes yeah. if you're talking to your mates and you actually want to see him a bit yeah, better, yeah. then let's see if we can do what Neil does. Yeah, he put he like like that. Oh, maybe it's something to do with something like that. Oh, oh that's not. How's the one. that? No, 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 it doesn't work. No, no. Kai, I don't know. Is the we don't know, Kai. We he's don't got know. a strange head, so that might be something to do with it. Yeah, he's a very strange dude. And that basically what you do works very it well. It works well, and it works also with other brand helmets and glasses um, in the top vent now, basically. Go for that. Go for that. Great answer. Great answer. Right, Carl, Carl Mathis uh, says, can you explain what the compression setting on the fork does? Oh, nice. Nice basic question. Because a lot of people get freaked out by suspension because okay. there's compression, and there's high speed and there's low speed, yeah. and there's rebound. And Doddy, give us the basics. The basic is it's slowing the energy down as you compress, basically. Right. That is that simple. The compressing is the act of the fork moving through its travel as yeah. it compresses. Yeah. And the more damping you put, the more energy it slows down. Right, okay. Essentially, so the more is absorbed and not transmitted to you. Okay, so in, in dummy terms, right, yeah. the thicker and thicker the custard, the yeah. slower the spoon will go in. Yeah, that's really good. Did I'm that work? I'm having that one. Yeah. Yeah. All right. That's very okay. good. Okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> there you yeah. go, guys. I, I didn't think of that. that. Um, but you know what? Suspension can be confusing. So let's take a look at this jargon buster that gets into some of those weird words they use. So first up is compression. Now this refers to the way damping is controlled on a shock or a fork, for example, uh, specifically the way it's controlled when it compresses. The adjustment for compression is usually a blue dial or a switch. Now those with switches tend to offer two to three positions with variations on what they do, which tends to be open, mid and locked. The typical compression adjustment you do externally on a shock with these dials or these levers affects the low speed compression of the shock. Now the low speed compression adjustment can effectively be used to keep the bike more balanced. So for example, under braking with no low speed damping, the forks are naturally gonna to want to dive and that's weight transfer, that's what happens. But by adding some low speed compression, you can effectively hold the front end up so it resists that dive because that's movement at a low speed. That's how that damping works. Well, that got us into the suspension subject, didn't it? Ooh, that yeah. did. Um, but we've got more. We've got more, Doddy. Look at this. Uh, Fixie Function Art says, um, I was wondering, can MTB air suspension use compressed gas like nitrogen instead? for just compressing the air um, for more of a damping effect. Uh, I guess you could, but I don't see why you would ever need to, because air is free and it's readily available to put in yourself with a pump. <laughs> um, That's right, how would you get nitrogen into your shock? Well, that would involve expensive equipment. Right, Really. So, that might be one reason yeah. you don't do it. Yeah. But um, I'm sure you do use nitrogen in in, uh, in the piggyback. Piggybacks. Yeah. Well, I never really understand what the piggyback's doing, if I'm honest. It um, looks good, okay. I want one on there but only because it looks good. They do look good and yeah. they do have a better effect for, let's just say, put it like this, so you have a nice small shock yes. yeah, and it's getting overused on say a real fast bumpy descent. Yeah. It's going to get hot. hot As yeah. it gets hot, you get damping fade. Right. Basically, mm -hmm. um, and you, basically the damping reduces in what it's actually doing. Yeah. So essentially the more oil and, and the better shim stack you have inside there, yeah. the less chance you have of that. Just oh, okay. spreading everything out on the internal over a bigger space. Right. Bigger surface area. I've got you. And it looks cool. It does look really cool. Which is yeah. probably why they did it. And they thought. use nitrogen in the shocks because it's less affected by atmospheric pressure and heat and all the rest of it. Right. Okay. Um, it's quite fiddly to put in though. Okay. But we've but we've got no nitrogen shock pumps right now. No. Fixie. We, so we, we have none. We have none. So we're not gonna be able to do that. It's, you know, like I say, air's free. Um anonymous pH, he says um, I'd like to know how the cross-country riders with drop stem and high seats ride steep sections and drop-offs without tipping um, out over the bars because uh, they've got such limited body movement on the bike. So yeah. how do they handle that? Oh, oh it's the worst feeling, isn't it? it when is, you're on a big steep drop-off yeah. and you've got that seat really high and it just bumps you and you're like, oh no. I've, it's, I've, I'm it's not practice. It's practice yeah. and more practice. Essentially, um, yeah. you would be amazed on what cross country bikes can do today. They may still look like they're going to tip you over the front, but yeah. quite often the bottom brake is a lot lower than you think, yeah. which means you're sat in the bike a bit more and it's not quite as pitched over as it might look yeah. on screen. Um, you know what? On a drop off, I can show you here with Mini Troy Brosnan. <laughs> um, on a drop off, um, you can 
Uh, and Chris Ackrig taught me this. Yeah. Chris Ackrig taught me this, so it must be true. Usually when you go and drop off, you'll try and get really over the back. You'll do this thing, you know, where you try and get really over the back. Yeah. Um, now, little Troy Brosnan's legs don't bend, but imagine his feet are still on the <laughs> pedals. Chris Ackrig showed me that if you get yourself right down in between the bars and the seat, really sit down into that, f uh, that front space there and the cockpit, you can you can essentially go off a really steep drop without getting your weight back over the saddle at all. You just drop it down below the bars and in front of, uh, in front of the saddle, and mm. and he just sit he goes off such steep drops like it. But don't you end up in. looking like Chris Froome going down a mountain? You do, position. you it's do. A bit weird. But it was for very low speed drops, and the yeah. grip you get on the front tire is incredible. And Chris Ackrig does it. It can't be wrong. It can't be. And little Troy Brosnan does it. But. Is so, he trying it with a stem that's like this? It's new putting you out the front door already. No, it's not with a super so, long stem. That's true. That's true. Um, there, there is something, in fact, that Chris Ackrey does do and Neil and a few others do. When they're riding those steep drops, just before they go into a drop, let's just say this is a drop with little mini Troy Brosnan here, you wouldn't just ride off it and get kicked over. You can actually pre jump it slightly. So mm. it doesn't actually involve having to do a bunny hop and into it, but just unweighting as you go over the edge and yeah. you load load the surface that you're riding yeah. really helps. Yeah, you see Nino make... doing that quite a lot. Yeah, N I mean, Nino has been, there's been a few races now where he's chose not to use a dropper. Yeah. Um, but somehow is still, was it South Africa last oh, year? Oh, yeah, that was just unbelievable. And you're looking and going, how is he doing that with that seat what? post? Even if he starts not winning races again and it, it becomes <laughs> the end of the Nino thing. He, by far, in my opinion, he just outclasses everyone on how to race and ride a bike. Yeah, yeah no, he I agree. He's phenomenal. I agree. I think he's got some special talents. He's a really I don't, good rider, I yeah. don't think it's the end of the Nino thing. I don't think so. He's got a little bit no. more to give, I think. Yeah, Van der Poel's got to go a long way to really be on a par at the moment. I, I yeah. think Van der Poel's focusing on Olympics only now, though, and he's yeah, kind yeah. of don't taking a bit of a siesta. <laughs> <laughs> right, Kenneth Mark says, do you guys think the pros are generally wanting to ride 29ers or is there just a heavy influence from their teams and sponsors? Um, so, is it? Great Do you mean question. pro downhill races? Well, I think uh, in cross country as well is what Kenneth's asking. Yeah. You know, some have just recently made the switch, but much later than other riders, maybe they just lost the fight against their managers, and some have only made the switch to mullet bikes, so yeah. they haven't gone full wing. So, what do you think? Um, it's an interesting thing, no doubt. Bike brands are going to want them to want yeah. the riders to represent the, the brands and what they're trying to sell. So the wheel size that is popular and doing a thing, but ultimately whatever is fastest is what they'll use because the mm. key is in their name. They're racers, yeah. And even if they don't want to run it, if everyone else starts running those wheels and they are faster, you have to run the bigger wheels to yeah to go yeah. with them. Yeah. It's that and, simple. And you've got people like Greg Minar really you know coming out and saying, "Man, this bike fits me now." And yeah, I, it was I nothing notice. to do with the bigger wheel. It was more yeah. the fact that the whole combination yeah, of things works better changed. for him. Yeah, yeah, because yeah. because uh, that's really interesting, isn't it? Because the the wheel size has reignited the geometry conversation you yeah, know because it has time. made people go oh, actually you know maybe the bike could be a different thing to what i thought mm. you look at a downhill bike now and they are they're really they really look different yeah they, they do looked, you know i mean if you look at minor well even, yeah. even further if you look at minor <laughs> on a 26 inch santa <laughs> it cruz it's ridiculous it, by now it looks ridiculous yeah it didn't at the time though <laughs> no and now, no. you know you look at him on the 29er yeah. and it just yeah. looks right it doesn't look like a big wheel bike it just looks like the correct yeah. bike yeah. for him dare i say it you even look at him now back on his honda it looks it looks Ridiculous. weird. Yeah. Hush my mouth. Of course yeah. it didn't. It looked amazing. <laughs> um, right, let's take a look at a, a wheel size video. So 29 versus 27.5 mountain bikes. Let's have a look at this. We've got a set of 29er wheels set up with tires, both are tubeless by the way. So it's actually really simple to swap just the cassette and discs over. So realistically, you could have two sets of wheels for this same bike and swap them over as you please. Set is on, time for the rotors. One final thing to do is just flip the chip.
Time for Correct Me If I'm Wrong. I love this bit. It's where you can get involved. You can send us bits of your riding on video. You can send it to GMBN Uploader. The link is in the description down below. And we can take a look at your riding like we're going to do now with Gabe's. Um, so, Doddy, what do you think of this, right? Um, Gabe's trying to negotiate. Have you ever had one of these logs in the trail that's sort of not bunny hoppable? It's just a bit too high. And it's really bouncy. So, so even if you're trying to be a front under. wheel. He's going over this. Oh, nice. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right. A, little man, a little man was going to ride yeah. underneath it. I was going to say, because yeah. I have the problem having to go under a lot of stuff. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no. Uh, this is, yeah. Right, so check this out. He's getting better and better as he rides over it. Oops. Look what he's doing. Just a bit of a chain ringer there. He's got a bit of a question. Is this bad for the frame? Um, no, it's not that bad for your frame. It's definitely bad for your chain ring. Yeah, um, yeah. I mean, it looks like one of those locks. Going by the look of it, it's It looks been quite hit. springy, doesn't it? It's yeah. springy and it's been hit a lot. Ooh. Oh. But That's he's, probably bad for your friend. He's really putting his bike through it. He's getting oh. there though. He's getting there. See what's happening? Come on, Gabe. You've got this. He's getting it. I know what he needs to do to improve. Oh, oh it's getting nice. there. Nice. Bit of confidence now. Yeah. Right. He's getting it. He's getting it. I think he's got the right idea. Let's pause it there. Definitely a tech thing mm. you could do to help yourself and help your bike. Get yourself a bash guard. Ah, oh, yeah. They're more like a skiff plate. They go on the underneath yeah. like a taco style shape. Yeah. Protects your chain ring. And when you hit that, you'll help your bike slide over it. Yeah. They're really great, yeah. actually. They're really, really, useful. really great. And how do they attach? They attach to the like um, chain. They can get yeah, to chain guide chain mounts. Guide but you mounts. can also get ones that mount to the BB itself. Right. So if you've got an older style bike, there's always an option for you. Yeah. No, they're really, they're really handy. In terms of a riding technique, mm. what you could try and do. Um, it's quite a trials move, but it, it's really effective. What I would have done on that particular obstacle if I was on the trail is you just learn to put your front wheel onto the obstacle and then lift, start a bunny hop from there. So as you come to the obstacle, you just put the front on and then hop. Mm. And what usually happens is it's easily enough to get the bash plate to clear it and then the back wheel hits, that puts the front wheel down and you ride through. And you can also like squash the back wheel over it as well to keep the front wheel high. Mm. So something to try, maybe putting the front wheel on and seeing how that feels. On a bouncy log, it can work really well. Yeah, and I like get that. Because it pulls you up. Yeah. It's really cool, it's really cool. But it's a really good trick. But fair play, you stuck at it, you got it. Um, and that's so working, yeah. that's working. So great, correct me if I'm wrong this week. Um, if you would like to send us one in, make sure you go to the uploader. Um, yeah, and there we are, that's Ask for this week. We'd Oof, love, we'd love some, yeah, we'd love some questions for next week in the comments section down below. Um, and yeah, Doddy, uh, what video would you like to throw us to if the guys here want to stay watching GMBN? Anything that's struck your mind? Maybe something with a tandem in it? I this don't know. could only be that video. You have to watch the Danny McCaskill tandem video with Martin. It yes. is nuts. Click just there. And I tell yeah. you what, I'm going to just... That's a very scared man on the back of that tandem. Yeah, I'm just going to keep with promoting myself. We've got the Rob Warner one over there by Doddy. Oof. Hit the globe to subscribe. <laughs> and uh, yeah, we'll see you next week. Thanks see you much. later, guys.